Hello and welcome to the DMs Book Club, a podcast where we read about some Dungeons and Dragons and discuss how we might include it in our role-playing campaigns. Now, Ryan, I've actually thought about this opening. Oh, yeah. I, I thought about it way too hard in the last 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> 10 minutes? I thought this was a long-term thought, but okay. Well, no, I, I realise that, how bad my openings are, right? So, instead of improvising, I've got some jokes for you, because I know you love a good joke, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, so my first joke is... Why are spellcasters most unbalanced? Oh, why are spellcasters most unbalanced? I don't know. Because they can trip. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's quite good. Yes, I'll have one. I did it. I'll all right, that one. That's good. all right. Yeah. All right. Se- second one, second one. What do you call a fae that is a thousand years old? What do I call a fae that is a thousand years old? I don't know. A uh, millennial. <laughs> That is awful. And I love what do you that. mean that's awful? That's great. You know why it's awful. Go on. Okay, one final more. one. Final one, right? Did you hear about the sensitive rogue thief? Did I hear about the sensitive rogue thief? No. Okay, he took everything personally. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that is amazing. I am right. I expect three knee jokes every time you oh, start no. a podcast. Oh, yeah. No. Well, yeah. okay. Well, I will quickly introduce myself. My name is Fiona, and now I'm panicking because all my good material has gone. <laughs> and with me is my co host, a wonderful friend, Ryan. Ryan, how, how are you? <laughs> I'm good. I, I am unexpectedly laughing. That is brilliant. <laughs> I have to say, have you ever seen, and I hate to plug other things, but I think there is a Reddit thread called D&D Dad Jokes, and it is the most wonderful thing because it's just full of all of these, like, you know, terrible dad jokes. I need, I need to have a look at it. And it's I, just... Well, I will, I will definitely check it out. But as you know, you are you are the, the dad joke master. I'm just like... <laughs> And that, that took way too long to come up with. So no, I am proud of you. I am proud of you. That is wonderful. A good dad joke will get you through the day. That's what I think. <laughs> so Ryan, what have you been up to? How have you been in general? Things are good. Things are good. Yeah, we've enjoyed a, a brief glimpse of summer in England, which has been mm. unexpected and brilliant. Although I have the smugness. I live about 300 miles north of where Thea does, and it's been nicely warm here you know like that sort of if you were cooking it would be a soft sizzle just a really Mm -hmm. slow controlled thing and in the evenings it's been nice and cool Mm -hmm. whereas every time I see photos or videos of you guys down in London oh it looks like you cook eggs on pavements (laughs) (laughs) yeah and the egg is my face um it is (laughs) It has been What's your so... face doing on the pavement? Because I've melted, Ryan, obviously. I see. Oh, there we go. I thought you were just this weird, bizarre ah. thing of you, like, leaning over with your cheek pressed against the concrete. Yeah, it's the only cool place that we have, yeah. <laughs> it's been interesting, like, a couple of... Like, yeah, even a couple of weeks ago, it was really cold. I remember I had loads of blankets on, and then suddenly overnight, it just became, you know, 20, 21, 22, all the way up to, like, we got to 28 degrees Celsius. And that's where I, I swapped everything for, like... So loose tops with straps, everything like that. Even in meetings, I was just like, this is this is too warm. I had shorts mm-hmm. on. And then we had the, the break, as it were, which then the, the rain came, but there wasn't a thunderstorm. And that's what my thing when I know uh, it's officially happened. So yeah. I'm just there going, where is that thunder? Where is it? And now it's just been miserably raining, but also slightly muggy. So instantly I'm just like... Oh, it's not yeah. happened it's not happened yet as an aside to this that if you ever needed to know fee is absolutely obsessed with thunderstorms i i often you know i get this she's pretty much the only person that actually updates instagram but i follow so every time i go onto it i can see whatever she's been posting but if there's been a thunderstorm without fail there are at least seven videos of just oh there's lightning outside oh there's lightning outside <laughs> it's amazing yeah. you're like some sort of like happy dog whenever it happens just oh it's so cool yeah especially when you see it hit not buildings, but hit stuff in the distance. I was like, oh, I've been there. It's so close to me. But then, yeah. of course, presumably if you're outside going, oh, God, it's so close to me. Run away. That's I know. That. I know. London's under attack. attack. Yeah. No. It's like War of the Worlds again. Oh. Anyway, anyway, with all my all my thunder business out of the way, Ryan, what are we doing today? What, what is our topic of choice? So today we are putting our DM hats on again as we're going into a topic that involves a little bit of creative thinking and is one of the more difficult things to put into a campaign. Now, when I say campaign, often I will charge into that definition when I'm explaining about things. What I mean is anything that you're running as a DM that involves a bit of a narrative story arc. It may be, you know, a sequence of one shots. It doesn't have to be necessarily a system of 
one large novel-esque story that you embark the players on over three, four years. It could just be five or six sessions that have an overarching theme or, or narrative in. Artifacts are what we're going to be talking about today. Artifacts are incredibly powerful, magical items mm -hmm. that are more to do with lore and story than they are to do with the mechanics of the actual game. And when I talk about campaigns, artifacts and campaigns kind of beautifully entwine because it is late game content in most cases, not always, but mm -hmm. in most cases, it's a way to give your story a focal point that normally involves in some sort of final hurrah, last battle, in final endeavor, the most amazing story at the end of your campaign that involves an accumulation of an artifact and the tales that, you know, go after that point. Think Tolkien, think Lord of the Rings and the One Wing is the most famous example of an artifact you can give. Something that not only is a powerful magic item, and when I say powerful, I do mean powerful. We're talking about things that are so enwrapped in the story of their creation, who's owned them, what maybe the bad, the big bad or the big good or whoever it might be is looking at this artifact and thinking this is part of me, I want this. Mm. It tells the story, it enraptures the players. It, it, it is a very, very important thing. I'm very intrigued by this because I've actually played, um, I've, I know I've said it before on this podcast, there's an RPG called Artifact where you actually play you create the item and then you pass it from sort of keeper to keeper and your influence, whether it be good or bad, corrupts that keeper. And that's why they pass you on. And so you create this beautiful history. And then at the end, it says, hey, you could also put this into any of your RPG games because you've already created the lore of it. So mm -hmm. I'd be interested to see what it's like from a D&D from a &D perspective. Absolutely. Exactly. And that is a really, really good way of thinking about it, because there's many, many things you've got to think about with any magic item creation. I think we've already had an episode where we've gone through and made and spoken about creating magic items and artifacts mechanically have a lot of similarities to that. So if you haven't listened to that episode, go back and, and have a listen because it might, might help you a little bit with the mechanics. But as you say, artifacts are more than just stats on a sheet. They are all of the lore and story that goes behind them because that's what give them their unique flavor. And that's what actually you can use to not only help create the item mechanically, but also to give it context in the world. It is that sort of thing where you think, what what is an artifact? For me, like I'm thinking of like Indiana Jones type thing where you've got the art of the covenant, where it is something that is got a tremendous power and there is a history and origin for it, but it could be for good or evil. Whatever it is, it shouldn't, the reason that it's coming to the story and reason maybe your players have it and maybe not a, a minor character has it is because there is a significant point. This is for the right time, right place. But even it does say at the end, it said maybe you are journeying to find this, this artifact to either acquire it or to destroy it, or even somebody else already has it, a major villain perhaps, and they are starting to use it for their own means, mm -hmm. which I thought was a really cool way, again, thinking about it, but where to put them in your story. Yeah, exactly. And that's where the flavor of the storytelling is totally down to you as a DM as to what you want to do, where do you want to put the items and how they get put into the story. But artifacts are story pieces and they can really, really bring a campaign to life or in some cases accelerate it to a focal point towards the end when you are ready to have a bit of a boss fight. You say that as if something's happening in our campaign, right? <laughs> Where we've also just acquired a couple of sessions ago an amazing artifact. Um, and I'm like, oh, really? A big boss fight? I, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, we've got into to epic level combat in our uh, our campaign and the, they're, they're really enjoying it. Really, really, really enjoying everything yes. that, you know, happens. But uh, yeah. there we go. Yeah, definitely not running away from every big fight because we're like, nope, done now. Nope. <laughs> If we talk about sort of the idea about how to put these things into your campaign, you've already mentioned a couple of the ways that you might see an artifact. The one thing to remember is that artifacts are tremendously powerful. You cannot create them as players, and typically the NPCs in your campaign will not be able to create them either. They are not tradable goods. You can't really buy these things or sell these things. They are one-offs, and they are in just absolutely created by a huge narrative and story. The DM's guide actually gives a few examples of some of these artifacts that you could put into a campaign. And they are things like the Iron Hand of Vecna, who yep. is an incredibly like famous 
demi lich god want to be destroyer of the world and, and all the things there are books of exalted deeds and vile darkness which are the manifestations themselves of good and evil and even sort of towards the start of it the acts of the dwarvish lords which is an example of an axe that was created by the most ingenious dwarves over a long period of time and is very much a one-off that's how you should really think about artifacts um we've spoken about legendary powerful magic items before if you remember you've got common you've got rare very rare and then you've got legendary yeah this is one step above that technically artifacts are legendary magic items but they they can't be sold or traded or or created in the same way Artifacts exist in your campaign and always have existed. They are lost, buried, used, utilized, however it may be. But your players are not just going to be able to pick these up randomly. There will be a story, some sort of plot device that you give them in order to acquire or find an artifact. You've given some great examples. Maybe the big bad has had Mm. this artifact throughout the whole thing. Maybe very Lord of the Rings style, the ring was lost and is found by a player at some random point, or maybe very much like a sort of a Scalibur sort of deal, or or maybe even a Harry Potter Elder Wand style sort of thing. In order to obtain the item, a large sequence of quests where rumors have to be acted upon, deeds have to be done to very powerful NPCs, you know, to gain favor or to Angevin in some way. And you have to really dig out this artifact. Um, We, in our campaign, for instance, we had basically two artifacts that have come into the story one very very early on in the story that happened pretty much i think episode five where i I threw it in beginning of the game where where your player um died right at the beginning Mm. and um, oh yeah yeah no no so i realized which artifact you're talking about i was was like that's something to do with me oh yes it is to do with me yes i remember (laughs) yes yes which is bear claw which is effectively a sentient um sword Mm -hmm uh of power that's only sort of really beginning to understood at this point um but then later in the game we had um a light of the lady which is a a lantern of of sort of good light and revealing and gained because the players embarked in a i think it was like an eight or nine session quest a very tense time but yeah <laughs> yeah and dealt with a lot of evil stuff to, to get it so that's sort of how you need to think about it but once you've got the idea of the artifact and, and how to get your head around it you've got to think about what an artifact means to the campaign mm. an artifact is so powerful that you owning an artifact is a big statement in itself people want it villains want it npcs want it random pit fiends angels powerful elementals they may track you down in order to take the artifact from you the, the gift we've spoken about the gift for multiple times i mean the, the gift yankee they may just appear from the astral sea and say you know what this plus three legendary sword yeah i'll take that that sounds mm-hmm. great i'll bring this back to my lich overlord she, she would absolutely love this mm-hmm. um owning one of these things is a statement to the cosmos equally a big bad owning one of these things is an event that may spark the downfall of the cosmos entirely if asmodeus the arc devil for instance were to pick up the high end of vecna and be able to to possess them that could be the one thing that tips the blood war in favor of the devils which starts to unravel the entirety of the good and known struggles in the world to the point that you you that is the end that is the beginning of the end artifacts are incredibly powerful maybe in order to stop the end of the world you need to destroy the, i mean i keep going back to the one ring but it is a very good example great example yeah exactly the, the actual artifact existing always means that the big bad will exist in some form maybe you destroy them but like the the tarask they will appear again a thousand years later i mean a thousand years after that and every generation has to lay down stories in order to power a hero that hopefully will deal with it until the ring is eventually destroyed these are the sort of things you've got to think about when you think of artifacts i will just because you mentioned a couple of artifacts there just having a quick look myself the axe of the dwarvish lord is beautiful and garish and oh yeah like oh yeah on page 221 it is just so many gems so many things like it is it feels very ornate but obviously like having a quick look at the stats for it it is incredible like and actually looking quickly through all of these there does seem to be a good sort of set of examples which are also good but also bad like the the hand and eye of Vecna it's an Mm. interesting one because that is a two-parter really because obviously they are individual items in themselves but together they can create more and more uh 
well, evil, essentially, because Vecna yeah. is uh, an evil god. So, yeah, yeah, interesting. Absolutely. And that's something to say as well. Artifacts don't have to be neutral. They can be good. They can be bad. They can be in between lawful, chaotic, angelic, fey, whatever you choose an artifact can kind of take that property. And the thing about artifacts is that they are so powerful. And we'll talk about these sort of properties in a second, that they begin to change your character just purely because of the attunement to something that is this powerful. As I say, each one of these artifacts has a story of creation. They don't just get made in the traditional sense. There is an entire legend that goes behind creating it. So Dwarven Lords one is, is a pretty standard one where effectively Moradin, the Dwarven God, helps a prince to effectively create these items. I mean, it it is a god has created this item mm. effectively, to, to put it down. But the Iron Hand of Vecna, obviously a hugely powerful demigod lich thing, um, you know, has its hand and eye removed by its lieutenant Cass. Uh, the Sword of Cass, I believe, is yep. a item in itself created by the absolute manifestation of just absolute hatred and evilness. A wand of Orcus. Orcus is a demi uh demon, demon. isn't it like a demon yeah. lord we, we demon spoke person. about him i think in our demons episode so yeah absolutely so absolutely so these things are incredibly powerful and can only be created by beings way beyond way beyond anything mortal um and the story of destruction is very similar artifacts cannot be destroyed in the traditional sense not like even magical items are pretty resistant to damage and to force but artifacts cannot be destroyed they are immune to all damage apart from a very particular way of destroying them that is all created and, and to do with its creation so the, the the book gives a few examples of must be melted down in a volcano forge or crucible in which it was created let's think about yeah, lord of the rings there we yep. go that's a Done. that's yeah. another one um dropped in the river sticks swallowed and digested by the tarasque or some other ancient creature of bathed course. in the blood blood of the god or angel i mean we're talking very difficult things here mm -hmm. yeah very difficult very high level things that has to be a quest to do it it's not just something you would find on a market store per se but maybe you do but then the, the way you go about activating it or destroying it yeah it is a journey in itself so i yeah i it made me laugh about that thing about like it must be swallowed and digested by tarask could you imagine if that was your only option and you're just like well, come on, lads. <laughs> yeah, we've got we've got to go. <laughs> How are we going to do this? How oh. are we going to do this? This is absolutely impossible to try and get a situation where we can wake up the Tarask, feed it the axe, and then somehow kill it afterwards after it digests it. So you know, you've got to wait a little bit to make sure it comes out. What is it? Three days for it to, to pass. Yeah, you're just like, oh god, could you imagine? It's like, yeah. oh, come on, finish up. Yeah. I will, yeah, I will yeah. say though that my my favorite way of destroying it is that it must be returned to its creator, who can destroy it by touch. It's mm. the idea that, again, this idea that the creator, like you were saying, is, is someone that is, it is not just another blacksmith per se, you know, it is some sort of god or deity or some one of wondrous power that is simply touching it destroys or makes it inert and i just thought that itself is such an incredible quest to go back and it's in my head it'll be like um well for, well, for example when uh our friend sam his character met bigby in our campaign and it's just like it's not what you expect at all and they're just like oh i'll sort that no worries i'll put it in the drawer with all the others you know just yep. <laughs> so that's what i like yeah. about that it's just like it, you could make it as like it's not a serious moment it could actually be a quite comical moment on that yeah aspect. exactly see that's a great way of thinking about it i was thinking more for instance, the eye of Vecna destroyed by Vecna taking the eye and exactly destroying the item by effectively putting it back in his head. Yeah. So maybe, maybe that's sort of what I was thinking, but yeah, I did totally, totally. Could you, yeah, oh God, you, you go and meet Vecna and the possibly the worst person in the world. <laughs> and mm. then be like, here's your eye back. And you're like, thanks. Now I must kill everything. So. Yeah. But anyway, we've spoken a bit about artifacts. What I'm trying to convey here is the gravity of how important these things are. You don't roll them on a table uh, and stick them into a campaign. You don't just sort of randomly include them. This is something as a DM, you have to think about this and really decide, I want this artifact in my story. So how was it created? What does it do? How was it destroyed? Who has it? Who wants it? And why is it important to my campaign? You, you know... Legendary powerful items such as amazing swords, for instance, can be just popped into the game uh, on a table roll. And yes, they're really powerful and coveted, but artifacts are so drenched in story 
that you have to think about it. I'm going to just keep saying that until it's uh, really digs in. But <laughs> we talk about the actual mechanics of these things now. Yes, please. All right, where do we start with these uh, with the mechanics for making artifacts? The idea about an artifact is that pretty much they can do anything you want them to do. They are items of tremendous power. There is no such thing as really too powerful. You just more have to have context as to why and what it does. When you're making an artifact, there are several ways you can go about it. Either you can take one of the artifacts in the DM's book and sort of tweak it or reskin it in order to be whatever you want it to be. So for instance, we've been chatting a little bit about uh, the axe of the Dwarven Lords. Well, hey, Presto, you've now got the great axe of the giants or yeah. you've got the long spear of the elves, whatever it might be. These things can be very easily reskinned and repurposed for whatever you need them to be. The other way you can go about them is to take a legendary powerful item, so one of the rarest magical items in the game, and then amplify it into artifact status by using some of the artifact property tables that we are discussing now. This is one of the things about artifacts that make them interesting, the storytelling devices they give you. And to do that, they give you minor and major beneficial and detrimental properties. Different artifacts have different combinations of them. Typically, the more powerful, the more detrimental things they will have on top of the major uh, sort of uh, positive things. So things tend to balance out a little bit. Mm -hmm. If an item is incredibly evil, typically they will have detrimental properties as well, but they also have beneficial properties. Um, right. There are tables in the DMs book to give you all kinds of flavors as to what your item may do to you. And some of them are mechanical and some of them are not. So if we go through some of the beneficial properties, for instance, mm -hmm. um, the axe of the Dwarvish Lords has two minor beneficials and one major beneficials. So you would roll the D100 on the table. So I've got some lovely dice here now. I've got a 16. So while attuned to the artifact, you gain proficiency in one skill at the DM's choice. Fairly standard, that. Yeah. So we'll go for a, a major beneficial. Uh, that's 34. So when you hit uh, with a weapon attack while attuned to the artifact, the target takes an extra 1d6 damage of a weapon's type. Ooh, so pretty standard stuff. It, these are all mechanical. You can do things like being able to cast cantrips or spells from it, getting armor class, um, not being able to be blinded, deafened, petrified, stunned, that sort of thing. So beneficial traits are fairly easy to do. The detrimental properties are interesting because they start to do things that your player would not want or maybe if you like a bit of role play these things can be quite fun mm -hmm. but detrimental is an understatement on some of these so if we go <laughs> the, the uh, minor detrimental properties of the axe of, of the dwarvish lords for instance there's two of them so if we roll this quickly that is a six. So the first time you touch a gem or piece of jewelry while attuned to this artifact, the value of the gem or jewelry is reduced by half. Oof. Just a little flavorful thing, but you start to degrade and, and rot all gems and, and metal-based jewelry effectively. That's see, that's quite a cool one. That's just quite cool. It's, it's just storytelling. Like, why would that be? The axe is so garish, it draws mm. the wealth of things that you touch into it. Yeah, it, all, it all pales in comparison, isn't it? That's the, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, and we've also got a, here we go, 63. While attuned to the artifact, you can't smell. <laughs> so we've actually, I, I threw these into our campaign a little bit. There are, there are things here that say, for instance, you must eat and drink six times the normal amount each day. That is mechanically quite a difficult thing to do if you're quite low level and supplies are at a little bit of a of a loss um, while tuned to the artifact all holy water within 10 feet of you is destroyed so that's pretty that's pretty cool mm -hmm. some of the major detrimental properties are absolutely brutal um <laughs> role playing things like when you attune to the artifact you determine your alignment daily at dawn by rolling a d6 oh, twice so you can go from being good to evil depending on how you wake up that's a real wrong side of the bed issue i mm -hmm. think Taking damage when you attune to the artifact, 8d10 psychic damage. That's um that's pretty, pretty intriguing, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There was one here, I couldn't remember if it is a oh now is it a small thing or a big thing? I'm just reading for it. It's something to do with long rests, and I don't remember oh. where um, it is. Having a look, having a look. 
Oh, there we go. It's, it's, it's actually a minor detrimental property. While you are attuned to the artifact, other creatures can't take short or long rests while within 300 feet of you. Oh, wow. That that seems a major one rather than a minor mm-hmm. one. I know, I know. I guess all you've got to do is just set up camp a little bit away, but Bye. still, yeah. I but, mean, like, what, but what if you're in a tavern or something? You're like, well, we can't stay here. <laughs> oh, God, that means, like, was it everyone... Was it everyone in the party? Other creatures. So not, not just your party. Everyone yep. in the tavern can't sleep or take other. Wow. Yeah. That's Oh, that's an interesting one. I like yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. But you've got to think about the storytelling applications of it. Like if, for instance, you are telling the story of the axe of the Dwarvish Lords, and that is a detrimental property. So this, this axe is incredibly powerful. And we'll talk about the actual axe in a sec because it gives a good flavor as to how powerful these things are. Mm-hmm. This could be a detrimental property for the axe where you've got a king, the king or the queen of the dwarves, whoever it might be, the ruler of the dwarves, they have the axe and they have sat on the throne for 50 years and the axe has slowly corrupted them and made them greedy because they can't handle the power. It's the status of the throne, but it's become a burden. And now anybody that sleeps within 300 feet of the ruler of the dwarves no longer can take a long rest. So sat inside the castle, slowly going mad, the entire ruler's consort, court, guard, slowly begin to go mad from sleep deprivation and desperation, not knowing what is causing this. The ruler is hiding the properties. Maybe they have to exile themselves so that everybody in the kingdom can sleep. Or maybe a madness sets in and some sort of catastrophe befalls the kingdom, and that's why the kingdom fell. It, you've got to think about these things from a storytelling point mm. of view. Like, well, how, can you, how can you throw these things in? I mean, was there anything here that you saw that you just went, no, 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 I would, it, even a legendary item would not be worth this? I did, I did have a wonder about the alignment one. Like, again, because maybe, and I know we said this in like, pretty much every episode since Tash has come, has come out, like alignment doesn't mean much anymore. So I don't know whether like that per se, again, tweaking it possibly so that you feel, uh, I don't know, you wake up grumpy or you you feel less, you feel more animosity or, or less animosity to, to people around you or something like that, rather than like, you are now chaotic evil, you know, which I, I, I think there's, that can be such a, a switch. And I think, Again, I'm sure we'll have a proper episode in it at some point, but alignment in general, I just think it's one of those things where people go, well, wh- well what do I do? Okay, kill to evil. All right, I kill everyone. And I feel like there's so many better ways for doing it. And there's certainly like evil in general. I think people don't realize that it's, a, I feel like it's more of a selfish thing in mm. terms of like, what's your intentions moving forward? It's not necessary to go out and kill everyone in the town if it only if it furthers your own ambitions. But that's by the by. I think the other ones, I do quite like the... Um, the, the one right at the end for the major detrimental one. So when you become attuned to this item, there's a 10% chance that you will attract the attention of a god that sends an mm. avatar to wrestle the uh, the artifact from you. Um, and it has uh, an Empyrean. Is that how you pronounce it? I'm not mm. sure. But it's it's pretty, yeah, once it attains the artifact, it avatar vanishes and that's it. And I like the idea that it's that 10% chance that you just always, that's when you were attuned to it. So that's... Yeah. Um, so it's, so only, like, it's only yeah. the ones. It's only the ones. I'm actually looking up an Imperian stats. Like I think these things are quite powerful, aren't they? Yeah, they are the they're the holy titans. Yeah. So they have a challenge rating of 23. So I mean that just shows you the sort of fun you could have where a challenge rating 23 thing appears and says, I'll have that artifact, thank you. Mm-hmm. Um and then Yoink. yeah. Exactly, exactly. In fact, weirdly enough, that's actually weirdly happened in our campaign recently, where a very high level thing came along and said, I'll have that. Thank you very much. And we and went, then left. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we did nothing. We did nothing. Yeah. I think the, finally, the, the last thing, again, it goes back to the alignment thing, but when you become attuned to this artifact, you must kill a creature of your alignment. And it's just a very simple sentence, but again, it's almost like a, a like for like in terms of like, well, you're taking on this, you're taking something. It's almost a bit like, um, oh God, what's it called? Uh, I can't remember if there was an anime about it where it's about, no, I can't remember what it's called now. <laughs> we have two minutes of me going, ah, no, uh, uh. Ooh, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> but again, that idea that you have to sacrifice something in order to keep this item. And I guess if you com- if you combine it with some really good, uh, beneficial ones because I guess again you could just always pick them you don't necessarily have to roll mm. um but if you can you said these things are really good but it comes at a cost and the cost is a human life and that mm. you have to kill it or oh, well not even a human life another creature's life so yeah. it could be yeah anything which I think is I, I again good storytelling sort of thing it just it's just that simple line just to describe it exactly just like 
oh yeah, stuff that just gives you something that as a DM, you can seize narratively and think, right, well, how, how did that happen? And how did this get by? Um, if we talk about like an actual axe, we're going to make our own artifact in a second, just to yep. sort of give you an idea about how to do it. But the axe of the Dwarvish Lords is a really, really good example of just how powerful these things are. So it talks about effectively a dwarf prince um, seeing peril of his people and venturing under a mountain and making uh, a set of legendary items uh, alongside Moradin, the, the god of the dwarves. Um, he passes the weapon on. It was lost in a bloody civil war. And exactly, it's a one, one in, a, in an entire race sort of power artifact. But what does it do? The Axe of the Dwarvish Lords is a magic weapon that grants plus three bonus to attack and damage rolls. So it's a plus three weapon. That's um, that's pretty good. It also functions as dwarf abo- a belt of dwarven kind, a dwarven thrower, and a sword of sharpness. So already it has the power of three magical items thrown together. Mm. Sure, we're not in power, you know, entirely powerful, but you combine that with a plus three and suddenly this axe does an awful lot of stuff. Mm-hmm. You get two minor and one major beneficial properties, and you get two minor detrimental properties. You can use that to flavor the campaign as to how the item is functioning now. You gain the blessings of Moradin, which effectively give you dwarven traits where you have immunity to poison damage, not even resistance, immunity. Mm-hmm. The range of your dark vision increases by 60 feet, and you gain proficiency with Artavan's tools related to blacksmithing, brewing, and stonemasonry. So extra stuff. You can conjure an elemental, uh, specifically an earth elemental, when holding the axe uh, once per day. Just a challenge rating five creature for you there, just from nothing. You can use an action to teleport, uh, cast the teleport spell as long as it goes somewhere underground where it, it, um, you know, it will never fail. You can do that once every three days. You can actually cast teleport anyway, any way you want. It's just that if you go underground, it never fails. However, it also has a curse, yes. which is even just everything that's good. Oh, here we go. So uh, with each passing day, the creature's physical appearance and stature become more dwarf-like. After seven days, the creature looks like a typical dwarf, but the creature neither loses its racial traits nor gains the racial traits of a dwarf. Physical changes wrought by the axe aren't considered magical in nature and therefore cannot be dispelled. They can be undone by any effect that removes a curse such as greater restoration or remove curse the spell. But don't forget, that would just then happen after seven days again. So it just resets the clock. You would keep, you know, this curse is still on you as long as you're attuned to the item and you become more and more dwarf-like with each passing day. I don't I don't see that as a curse. <laughs> I think that's, a, I, again, like for me, when I think of curses and stuff as a player, I, and I guess because we've talked about this before with magic items, when you identify them, you don't necessarily identify any bad properties or any bad things from it. So I assume once you get this item, you wouldn't tell the players that this is a part of it. You know, if they identify it, so they use it just oh, so happens that it happens, and just being able to give that flavor to it, and they don't maybe they don't clock that it is this artifact that's doing it. I just yeah, for this one, it was just like it's quite a lot of flavor, which I love, and I was like. I don't think it's a bad thing like, mm-hmm. I, like again like you said you can if you, if you really desperate you can remove it but then as you said every other day it starts passing and then it happens again so i guess it depends on how much how much you 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 value not looking like a dwarf i guess i don't know yeah exactly and to some people that would be a really big deal and to other people they yeah. would be nonplussed by it at all but it's always something intriguing you can have a villain with this axe that looks like the dwarven lord and king but actually isn't all the while was a lich and just has been transformed into a dwarf and is hiding in plain sight as the ruler oh very cool exactly that sort of thing the idea is that you you have an incredibly powerful item it can do a lot of stuff and it's all to do with more lore than it is to do with anything else so what we're going to do is we're going to have a think about making our own artifact and I can kind of bring you through the process that I would use to, to go through one. Please. If absolutely. you were up for that. I always, always. Exactly. Let, let's make artifacts. Let's make artifacts. So Fiona, what sort right. of thing do you want to make? An artifact can be anything that is magical. So it doesn't have to necessarily be a weapon. It could be a piece of armor, a piece of clothing, a piece of jewelry, a game, a toy, just anything you want it to be, or a weapon. You know, weapons are, are very powerful things for people to use. 
I think um, let's not go for a weapon. Let's go for let's go for an item of clothing. I think clothing, clothing. is is not valued as much as it should be in D and D. So I want to I want to do something clothing wise. Perfect, and that's clothing as in a general piece of fashion wear rather than armor. Or are you oh, yes. wanting it to be armor? Oh, not not armor. <laughs> not armor. Okay, perfect. So already we've got us something. So. We need to think about a rough sort of story as to sort of the flavor of the item that we want to do. Would you like it to be tied to, for instance, a particular individual or a particular race? So, so we've already had items to do with like a lich called Vecna. Mm-hmm. We've also had a, an axe, but it's related very much to dwarves. Is there a sort of theme that you would like to do? Or is it more just something created by a god or mm-hmm. something that? You know, give me a flavor of a bit of story. Give you a flavor of a bit of story. So I like that idea that it it is like uh, given by uh, a race and stuff. Like I, I really like that idea of the the axe of the, of the Dwarvish Lords. I think why not? Not because we're going to talk about it anytime soon, but why don't we do something with halflings? Let's do halflings. Something. Yeah. Okay. So it is to do with the halfling race. This piece of clothing, halfling mm-hmm. race. Do you have an idea of what sort of piece of clothing you'd like it to be? A hat. A sock, a oh, coat. Man, if it was like an odd sock, that'd be crazy. But no, I think a hat. I think more people are going to go for hats. So definitely a hat of some sort. A hat. Okay, wonderful. That sounds really, really good. So how would uh, an artifact of, of hugely tremendous power that's shaped like a hat end up in the, in the sort of hands of the halflings? Is it something that was created or conjured into existence by a, a deity, a god? Um, was it something that was given to the halflings by something else of great power? Mm, yeah, I think it would have been given to a community of halflings by, by an entity of some great power, absolutely. Yeah, perfect. And the idea I want you to think about now is, is this something that the halflings should have and protects them or is it something that is more evil in nature and is more the curse oh oh okay interesting i think because halflings as we'll go into at some point they are very happy-go-lucky and that everything is good for them and they set aside so i like the idea that it's been given as a gift almost like a trojan horse type thing but actually it has uh, detrimental properties in some respect Okay, cursed. So it's a cursed item in some regard. Fine. Yeah. So it could so given to them in order to what did you say? Like protect them or yeah. So um again, not to give too much away, uh, they they're the sort of sort of communities that great walls do not touch them per se. They just so happen just to st- sidestep it. And I'm aware that because they've got some protection from their own gods or otherwise. So I like the idea that someone's annoyed that the halflings just so happen to like, you know, they, they seem to be so happy and content with themselves, but you, you know there are other places that have been ravaged by wars and stuff and it's like well you need you need to take your your fill of war itself so here is some but under the guise of like oh well we are good friends or something like that and we would give you a gift to show our friendship and it's actually not a gift at all i see but it's to draw the halflings into the world effectively oh yeah definitely okay right wonderful so we've got to think about an artifact that has tremendous defensive properties why the the halflings clearly want this to protect their communities so it can have incredible defensive um issues Mm -hmm. um you can i mean you've already mentioned that the halflings have this sense of wonder and exploration maybe that actually is the curse to it as well like maybe they lose that sense of wonder Mm -hmm. and excitement because the defensive element to it is too strong Mm -hmm maybe and sort of warps their their sense of like fun and and wanting Ooh. to leave and and yes. everything yes and maybe the halflings as another curse find themselves being pulled into wars more often than they mm. would like to be yeah like bad luck follows them wherever they go when they use this hat oh there we go okay so there we go we've got a great idea so that that sort of cursed item is 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 really good but it, it is a legendary item it is yep. an artifact so it's got to be incredibly powerful so yes. what we would do is we would have a think about some magical items that you would want to rope into to being sort of thing so do you want it to be tied to a particular um fighting style like obviously it's not a weapon so it's not going to give an attack bonus but do you want it to give spell casting bonuses or ac bonuses or things like that i definitely yeah if it's a protecting 
protecting sort of thing. I definitely think there'll be an AC bonus of some sort for sure. Okay. So what we can do is we can look through various um, magical items and take, I'm going to say we'll take three yep. um, because again, we're using the sort of axe of the Dorvish Lords as a bit of a template here, but it's going to take three items and kind of smush them together as to do, it does all of these things. So for instance, um, you could take, something defensive so some sort of armor maybe mm -hmm. um i'm thinking mithril mithril armor is here we go so if it normally imposes disadvantage on dexterity checks or have a standard strength requirement the mithril version of the armor doesn't so the mm. act uh, so the hat for instance could bestow the wearer the benefits of mithril plate armor mm -hmm. without actually necessarily having to wear it That'll be good. Yeah, absolutely. So it sets the AC to 18. Mm -hmm. That could be one thing. Um, I mean, in terms of other magical items, it, it, what sort of other things? I mean, do you have any you like? Any magical items you've encountered in campaigns that you go, oh, that was a really good one. We really enjoyed that. Mm. All right. So well, I've got a question there because obviously quite a lot of the stuff we've got in the DMs, uh, the opposite, DMs book, I was about to say, in the DMs uh, guide. Mm. Does it, when you're putting, if you're thinking like, oh, it's going to have at least three of these items properties together do you need to consider like if it's like i don't know two rare and one uncommon or can you just go as far as you want but as long as you make the detrimental properties account for it if you see what yeah, i mean exactly there's no limit on how powerful an artifact can be so if you pick three legendary items then yes this artifact can do all three of those things but there are the repercussions of what that might mean you may have more major detrimental properties if an item is too powerful and NPCs may want to take that item from you if it is really that powerful. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I would use your, use your imagination here. You can always go for a range of stuff if you like, or, or you can sort of not. No, I just, I was just out of interest. Okay, cool. Well, so there is one that I have thought of and I've seen it used in a campaign and I quite like it. It is, I can't pronounce it though. So it is the is it Petroba, the necklace of wound closure. That's one, eight, four. Okay. So when you yep. wear this pendant, you stabilize whenever you're dying at the start of your turn. In addition, whenever you roll a hit die, you regain hit points, doubling the number of hit points it restores. Oh, there we go. Okay, so that is pretty good. So there we go. So you are always stabilize and you roll hit dice uh, twice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay, that's really, really cool as well. And I'm going to say just to throw a third thing in, yes, just because. Um, I'm going to say that it probably has an effect of maybe uh, a staff of some kind. Mm -hmm. um, let's say it, more protective. Let's say, okay, I'm going to actually give it the abilities of the staff of the Magi, which is a legendary staff of power. Mm -hmm. so we can cast a lot of spells, a lot of defensive things there, okay. webs and walls of fires and and pass walls and, and plane shifts and stuff like that. So we'll, we'll give it the abilities of that. All so sounds good to me. All kinds of good stuff. So we're going to give it some minor and major but detrimental properties. So two minus. So do you want to roll me two minus if you've got a D100? Or I, I can give you some numbers if you want. No, I... Uh, I'll grab my dice. Weirdly, I didn't have my dice out, which but they're always within reach. So that's always, <laughs> always good. You've always got to have at least one set of dice within reach. Yeah, otherwise. Uh, so, uh, sorry, so how many how many majors and so minors? So, Romeo D100. Okay. We're going to go two minor and one major. For beneficial or for detrimental? Beneficial. Ooh, okay. Right. So, the first number is uh, a 26. A 26. You are immune to disease. Hell yeah. There you go. There's one thing that's quite protective. You can mm. kind of see that one. Definitely. All right. Second one uh, is 60 straight. 60, um, you can use an action to cast one cantrip uh, attuned to the artifact. Okay. So there we go. Um, we'll pick, we could pick a cantrip or it could be something like mending or it could be something that's sort of, you know, more protective. More protective than uh, attacking. Yeah, that makes sense. Perfect. Then... One major beneficial. All right, All right. let's do this. Uh, that is a 76. 76. Okay, so that is the artifact can cast one sixth level spell every day effectively so we could call that i think i can't remember if it is but like wall of force for instance could be something i think is sixth level it might be fifth level always forget um <laughs> but you pick a sixth level spell and you'd go yeah sure that that sounds really good mm -hmm. 
because we've thrown a legendary item into the mix, I'm going to give it one minor detrimental and then one major detrimental. So instead of just two minors, I'm going to go one major, one minor. So yeah. if you give me the minor roll. All right, minor roll coming up. Is a 77. 77. There we go. While attuned to the artifact, no. other creatures can't take short or long rests while within 300 feet of you. So there we go. This and we'll, we, we can wrap this up into the story of, of how this thing existed in a second. If you give the major detrimental property now as well. Mm-hmm, definitely. All right. That is a 51. 51. When you become attuned to the artifact, you gain a form of long-term madness. Oh. We, we've sort of gained the flavors of this. I'm going to throw a couple more more sort of general things in. Please, yeah. Um, so um, a lot of these properties to do with sort of the protection, we've, we've given it the, the armor bonus, which makes the, the, the wearer incredibly resilient. The wound closure thing. I'm going to say one of the abilities of this is that whilst you are within 300 feet of the person with this item, mm-hmm. the, the wound closure aspects to the thing also affects that person so Ooh. it spreads out and it radiates so it actually gives the entire community the ability to close like wounds that. and heal things yeah. as well i'll also say that the cantrip of mending or whatever it might be can also be cast at will by anybody within 300 feet Damn. and we're going to give it a curse i'm going to say that the curse of it is that inexplicably the community finds itself once every 50 years called into some major war in which the losses tend to be catastrophic. Oh my God. Wow. The other benefit will be that the community is hidden and otherwise isolated from all harm whilst the item is within the community. So it gives perfect protection apart from when it doesn't. Mm. And suddenly the community is called upon and it has to answer. That, that's rough that's rough <laughs> exactly exactly so we're, we're telling the tale of this this cap of the halflings then so we've got this this amazing I, i've got called it a cap but you know hat of the halflings oh, but a, a flat cap a thousand percent is a flat cap. exactly so let's say the community was under threat it prayed to outside forces or asked outside petitioned outside forces to protect it from some sort of roving clan or attack or something like that and the hat or the cap the flat cap was given but by nefarious means by a ruler who was sick of these halflings needing help but never contributing anything back to defense of the realm Mm -hmm. so it gave the community this amazing protection the ruler was almost indestructible the community could heal themselves fix all damage and keep themselves hidden from outside influence um, entirely maybe they could even turn themselves invisible at will as mm-hmm. well that could mm-hmm. be just something else or pass about trace something else that's not necessarily yeah. too too difficult but the catch is that the leader has become mad i mean flavored madness that you could give is that maybe the leader can't see all these negative properties mm-hmm. that they are they, they they truly believe the item is essential and that it has to stay and will, will rebuff all forms of uh, argument to say that this artifact has to be removed or destroyed. They just utterly think that it's the best thing in the world. But the community can't sleep when within 300 feet of this, you know, effect. So they all go slightly mad as well. Mm -hmm. Um, They want to stay within because the protection, but then they all often, maybe there's lots of exiles from the community because they couldn't stand it. And maybe the ones that remained now are slightly crazed and sleep deprived. And yeah, all joy is, is gone from them wow the greater good clearly yeah oh yeah exactly and maybe people leave the community um from the fringes of it um the few that do retain sense and they get called into the wars maybe hoping that actually they can find some sort of cure for it when they're out but fate befores them and how do they destroy this cap what what does this you know what needs to happen to it for this thing to finally be destroyed oh gosh i mean Uh, who even gave it to them the the king the mad king some sort of like I, I like that idea that like you're saying about this ruler getting annoyed how like the halfling community uh, wasn't contributing to all these great wars that were happening and and it felt like well it's time to go to go so I like that idea of the ruler being irritated by their subjects that mm. sort of like uh, Coriolanus sorry sort of way of thinking about it uh, in terms of destroying it 
what we got again? We've got ways to destroy it. It's like to throw it into things. Yeah. So yeah. destroying it in the place that it's created, dropping it in some sort of place or having it eaten by some sort of creature, but both of legendary importance, um, s- scattered by a special weapon, taken to another plane or returned to its creator. I think I quite like that it must be sort of uh, destroyed by a special weapon crafted for this purpose. I quite like Okay. Mm. So something has to be created that's powerful enough to remove this curse. Mm-hmm. Like, Got, like, yeah. Like some sort of like magical sewing kit that could just undo the stitching perhaps or something. Oh, <laughs> yes. Oh, the, the flat cap is actually stitched in. And, yeah. yeah. There you go. Crazy. <laughs> But there you go. That is that is an artifact, and you could you could throw that into a campaign and have this halfling community where the fighters are all super protective and very capable, but all seem a bit strange because they're all sleep deprived and crazy, mm-hmm. and no one will ever say where their community comes from. God, that that's like a proper like um, quest in itself to understand what on earth is going on with this village. I like that, like the, that the fact you can create an artifact and then base the campaign obviously around it you don't necessarily have to have the campaign and then throw something in at the end what a great way to sort of put things together oh that's mm-hmm. really interesting bloody halflings hey? <laughs> <laughs> but there you go there is an artifact brilliant thank you so much ryan this is i is it is it a lot to think about actually i hadn't really considered about we obviously had our magic making items uh podcast before and that that was really interesting as well but to go one step further and create something that is uh not a law dump as it but a pivotal point in your campaign really mm. really interesting thank you so much no yeah there you go and if you want to make an artifact yourself the best way you can do it is is take an artifact in the dm's book already and and reskin it or, or maybe even use it as it is but if you want to make your own then take a template and and run with it really no, thank you very much. Uh, well, Ryan, what is it that you do? Sorry, that was a really weird, of ask, weird way of asking that question. So, is there anything you'd like to plug? What have you been up to? Um, you can find me. I have a YouTube channel called Ursa Ryan. I play games and, and generally am silly, but you can also find me on Discord. I have the Ursa Ryan Discord, where you should come and join and say hello and talk to me about d d It would always be welcome and good fun but what, what, what were you up to how, how are you doing i like the fact you just breeze over that achievement of was it a million views on all of your videos that happened recently <laughs> just, I'll, I'll just drop that in there for you thank you it's, That's it's, incredible. Little, it's, it's, it's quite a cool milestone i won't lie <laughs> yeah absolutely um definitely not as cool as me but oh definitely much cooler than me that's what i meant to say not as cool as you hang no, on no, that's fine <laughs> let's, let's see what the cool stuff is yeah let's no, go for it what, what are you no. up to what are you up to what am i up to when i'm not trying to be cooler than ryan i am running the what am i rolling podcast which is a twice monthly rpg one-shot podcast as always it is going very well very well very well very well i ran for the first time uh, on a stream with with not strangers but with people i've known from different podcasts um i ran a game called bluebeard's bride last night which is a horror f- uh, fairy tale essentially about bluebeard oh. and but sort of twisting it on its head and there was a lot of prep i had to do and it turns out i didn't need any of it Lovely. Uh, <laughs> the Lovely. best kind welcome of game. to being a dm <laughs> <laughs> but it is it's very good um it will be out on it's out on the drunken storytellers uh youtube and at some point it will be put on the the podcast because hey everything is content um other things are going on i'm doing more improv which i'm sure people can follow and stuff but overall i'm, I'm doing all right things are slowly coasting and i i'm here for that good. sounds really really good love it well if you guys want to check us out you know where to now but otherwise keep listening because no doubt the next episode will be on shortly see you then bye bye, bye.